we will now open up the school board of St. Lucie County meetings, uh, special work session. The date is June 26, 2018, and it's 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, the session has been open, and we will have a, um, Mr. Gent, take it from here. Okay, uh, Dr. Mills, the first item here will be the public hearing, and um, so I'll Turn it back right back to you. Okay, we have the proposed adoption to the amendments of school board policies 5.14, 7.70, and the code of student conduct. Also, it is the school health manual. Can I please hear a motion? Well, is there any discussion on any of these? Public hearing, anyone out there that would like to make comments? No comments there, so uh, board, do we have any any conversation, any discussion? All right, at this time I'm gonna put it to the table and ask for vote. May I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved by Debbie Harley and a second by Catherine Hensley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Um, we need to go back so I can officially recommend that. Okay. Sorry about that. Recommend the, board of, recommend the board adopt the proposed amendments to the school board policy number 5.14, 7.70, the code of student conduct and the school health manual. Superintendent has made his recommendation. Should we repeat that? Yes. May I take Ms. Harley, motion, second, Ms. Anderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And uh, can we just move on at this time? Right. So uh, what I have here is um, that uh, I'm bringing a, uh, a personnel move to you at this time, and I'd like to uh, recommend that the board approve the appointment of Michelle Thomas as the, as the chief financial officer. Well, we have a recommendation by the superintendent. May I hear so so moved? Second. Okay. So moved by Ms. Holly and second by Mr. Ingersoll. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Uh, congratulations, Ms. Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Todd, I'm going to have I'm Michelle uh, speak at the next board meeting so that the audience and members of the community can see her as well. So that will save her uh, being on the spot here. But uh, she's sitting there next to Tim, and I just want Tim to come up here real quick because uh, Tim has served this district very, very well, and she has big, big shoes to fill, but we have a nice certificate of appreciation to thank Tim for all of his, uh, what he's done for us. <laughs> this is not water. <laughs> they almost dropped, dropped it. Thank you. Did you almost drop that? This, yeah. yeah the top, oh, I was going to say, the, the plaque, there's no money in the budget to replace the pack, the plaque, so, okay. And, and we as a board would like to say thank you also to Tim for your longevity here and for your service and your work towards St. Lucie County Schools. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I know that our board work sessions are normally uh, a little more informal than board meetings, and so um, we have another new employee that's here right now. Carrie, I'd like for you to introduce. Uh, Mr. Morales. Mr. yeah. Um, it is my pleasure, and Pam, would you please come up here as well? It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Edward Morales, who is going to be our new publications manager. We have been very, very privileged over time, Pam, come along, <laughs> to have Pam Hazelly serve in that role for many, many years in the district. She's very dedicated to what she has done, and he is um, being uh, tutored and mentored by <laughs> Pam uh, for the next few months. Pam will be with us until the end of September um, when she will be taking on the role of grandma extraordinaire for her grandchildren <laughs> and uh, just really truly enjoying um, some well-deserved time with her family. So thank you to Pam and we look forward to what uh, Edward will be doing with our district as we move forward with the great things publication has been doing and will be doing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to be introduced? <laughs> but we do want to thank Pam. Thank you very much, Pam, for your service in St. Lucie County Schools, and we wish you also the best of, of all in life. 
especially as a grandma, we know about that. So thank you, Pam, very much. Pam will be with us until September, so she's uh, yeah. got a few more days to, <laughs> to show up uh, and make this very transition. But I, I echo those comments. Okay, what I'd like to do now is uh, every time during at this time at the end of June, I uh, would go over with the board uh, the year in review. I go over my uh, individual goals that I have set to see where they are, and then at the very end, we'll uh, give you the goals for the for the upcoming year. So I appreciate you all being here this morning. I appreciate many some of you traveling back into town uh, for this as well. And uh, I think we well, I don't think I know we have a great story to tell. And so you've seen this slide before, the rise above it slide. Uh, and we use this not just because of the hurricane and what occurred to the, to the building, but this has been a most interesting year uh, for our school centers, for our community in the entire state and in the nation. Um, so naturally, uh, we think about uh, the storm that hit, but that had a direct impact uh, on our students and our families, and there was displacement. Families were displaced from this storm. And not only were we displaced, but uh, the families were displaced, more importantly, families. And that had a direct impact on our student attendance this year. And even though we lost those days, we never really recouped the instructional hours. So the successes that I'm going to show you today is really a testament to the hard work of our teachers and of our administrators and of our school staffs um, that we were able to, in spite, of, in spite of that one challenge, to continue to maintain and to move even forward and increase our scores. On top of that, you have the um, the national narrative that's going on right now with immigrations, and I'm not going to get political regarding that, but uh, even before what's occurred over the last two weeks, our students for the last couple of years, uh, many of our families are from other countries, and uh, our students have lived in, uh, I can't imagine and put myself in that position to know what it would be like to come home or to know that maybe uh, a, a relative, a loved one, a family member or whatever could uh, no longer be here, be deported. We've been following the story in Palm Beach of the restaurant owner um, and there's been public outcry on that. But when you break that down into individual homes and into individual families, um, that's something that these children have uh, that come to school with every day. And so that puts extra burden on our teachers, it puts e extra burden on our administrators to make sure that we're developing those relationships and we are empathetic to that and work with the students. So we've had that going on. The, um, we have over 1,400 homeless students in our county, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment as well. And uh, our schools have done, a, have done a nice job with that. Excuse me for just one second, and that wasn't it. My grandson had tubes put in his ears this morning, so I was waiting for a buzz um, to make sure that he came out of recovery okay, which it appears that he has, so that's good. So then I can, uh, we can relax a little bit more. Um, the uh, the, the uh, disaster in Parkland uh, and the effect that that's had, the uh, really emotional toil that that's... Welcome Ava. Ava's here sitting in for Chris. Uh, sorry, Ava. Hey, focus, focus. That's focus. focus. <laughs> well, Ava was the only one smiling. So, uh, focus, man, focus. Uh, and um, the, uh, that had an emotional effect on our school centers, on our families, on our children. Um, you know, we know that uh, uh, economic income and poverty is the number one predictor of student success. And yet we have said in this county that that's not going to be excused why we can't achieve at higher levels. Nor will any of these other events that have occurred, some man-made, some not man-made, uh, keep us from our mission of really educating our children and, and, and everybody getting at least a year's worth of growth. So in spite of those things, we've had a great year, and I'll show you some of that right now. The, um, we were accredited through advanced ed, which is a big deal because nobody wants to be in an unaccredited system because uh, then they, uh, somebody else takes over. And uh, normally when they came in and they did it, uh, they went into our schools, they went into more schools and classrooms than they normally do, and um, which was, we have a great story to tell and wanted them in there. But uh, they normally come out with one or two powerful practices of what they see in school districts. They had three for uh, St. Lucie Public Schools. The first one is that we're led by uh, an, uh, a visionary executive leadership team. The key word there is team. Um, and when I talk about the executive leadership team, I'm talking about the, the guys, the ladies and gentlemen that are sitting behind me, but I'm also talking about the school centers, and I'm talking about the leaderships in the school center and a direct reflection of this school board as well. Because we really are a, a board of uh, a school board, but we're a team of uh, five board members and a superintendent. So we're a team as well. And we've worked we're very well in that. So you can see that um, through that, we have had high levels of organizational effectiveness. The second, the second practice is that um, 
we've done numerous uh, partnerships with the community agencies, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And that's going to be a direct uh, credit to this school board as well as to our school centers, but especially to Carrie Patrick, who is really a, um, a team of two with her and, and Janice that are over there, and we'll talk more about that later on, but a great another powerful practice that they saw. And then number three is that how we analyze data and how we've utilized that data to, uh, to make changes in our, in our system and how that's been embraced by our administrators and by our teachers. But the great thing about data, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the, um, the leadership dashboard, is data takes the, the emotion out of things. It is what it is. And then you break it down and you try to figure out, okay, why did we, we perform well here? This is an area of challenges. And then what do we do to address that? It shouldn't be anything that's viewed as a get you system. That's not the culture that's established in this school district, but more of a tool um, on um, analyzing what's going on. I use this example with the principals all the time. Everybody remembers the Apollo moon missions and everybody remembers the movie um, Apollo 13. And the staff's heard this before. But 70 to 70 to 80 percent of the mission was about adjusting course by utilizing the instruments and the panels of what they had. Because what was the goal of the Apollo moon missions? You probably weren't alive then. Remember what the goal was? <laughs> to go to the moon. To go to the moon. But what else? <laughs> well, to go around orbit. To, to get back to safely. Say, oh, right? To get back safely. <laughs> to go to the moon and then to get back. Uh, to get back safely. They used every piece of tin foil to get them back. Exactly. So as you look at that and you look at the comp, the, you know, and, and uh, Tom Hanks did a good job. He did a good job and you're getting me off track now. Um, <laughs> when you look at, when you look at how they monitor the course and the course has to be continually adjusted, not just in that one because of a disaster. When people say, well, you're adjusting course, you adjust course to be successful. It doesn't mean that what you're doing wasn't working. It means you have to adjust this or you have to adjust that to make sure that the mission is that the mission is completed. In that case, it was to land on the moon and then to safely return. In our case, we adjust course because it's it's vital to the success of our mission of educating the kids. And that's the uh, the most simple analogy that I can use. And again, it's not a getcha system. These are my four goals for this year: to increase the proficiencies in three through ten, to create the leadership dashboard, uh, college and readiness skills, and decrease number of out-of-school suspensions. So I want to go into these. Uh, with you right now. Goal one number one, as we already said, to increase the proficiencies. We've got a nice story to tell here. You can see that in our, uh, in five of the uh, eight areas, five of the eight grade levels, we had an increase in grade five. Well, let's talk about grade three first. Grade three, um, we did have a dip. Grade three is the first year that our children are tested. Um, grade three is, um, a very challenging year. The achievement gap that uh, we see in our school district is something that's not created by the schools and something that we don't want to make sure that we add to. And we will show through grade three through 12th grade what we've done to close that gap. That's a gap that comes on uh, before the children enter school center. And when you come from 76% of students coming from uh, qualifying for free and reduced lunch, there are studies regarding the amount of vocabulary words that are spoken in a home, uh, the other things that, are, that, that are, are, are home based that create that gap before we even see the children. Some of you that work with early childhood know that better than anyone. And then it's our mission to, to, to close that gap as, 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 as well as we can. So we had a dip there in, in the third grade. Fourth grade, I believe, remained flat. Um, and so we look at that, fifth grade we had a nice 4% gain, seventh grade 2%, eighth grade 4, ninth grade uh, 1, and 10th grade 4%. So when you look at the uh, growth by uh, grade level, five of the eight grade levels improved. We have already begun looking at, particularly the uh, third and fourth grade area, what can we do differently? And there has to be a, a more increased emphasis on kindergarten, first and second grade, and different programs that are there. Because we, we did do well in two of the different areas, and there was a third area is where we stumbled in. Part of that will deal with vocabulary, an increase in vocabulary. A lot of that will be on teacher uh, professional development. Um, bringing in um, um, phonics as well, a heavy emphasis on vocabulary and phonics, which uh, we're up for that task. When we look at this here, I just showed you, I'm sorry, I didn't have that up there, but you have it in your, in your paper. That was the, um, the breakdown of the different grade levels that I just went over. And when you compare it to the state, you can see that we're not at the state level, but in some areas we would close the gap with the state where they may have, uh, let's look at uh, grade five, we made a 4% gain, uh, I believe the state made a 2% a gain. So we're gaining on the state in areas like that, that that's, that's important to look at. 
We also compare ourselves to ourselves, we compare ourselves to the standards, and we compare ourselves to districts that look like us. Um, our two surrounding districts don't look like us. One has about 40%, 30% free and reduced lunch, and the other in the 40s, um, which has a direct impact. Um, again, but then we'll compare ourselves to those around the state that look like us, and we've got a good story to tell. When we break this then down for grades three through 10, you can see through three through 10 language arts, FSA, a 1% gain. Moving over to 3.5, you'll see we stayed even, uh, equal with that, as did the state. You can see um, uh, when we go back to 3 through 10, the state stayed flat. We made a 1% gain there through 3 through 10. 3 through 5, um, the state and us were both flat. 6 through 8, you can see we made a, uh, the state remained flat. We made a 2% gain, gaining on the state. And then in 9 through 10, a 2% gain, and the state made a 2% gain. Again, another good story to tell about what's happening. When we look at math and we look at the one, two, three, four, five, the six cells there, we can see that we made a gain in math in three of the areas. Um, so grade three, again, was flat. You can see from the state perspective, the state was flat. Uh, in that, if I'm reading it correctly, I am. When we look at uh, grade four, we had an increase of 1%. The state fell by 2%. So we have a nice little story there to tell. Um, look at grade five, that's a statistically significant advance of a 7% advance. The state also advanced by 4%, uh, but we were able to narrow that gap there. A dip in sixth grade, um, as, and there was a gain at the state level in sixth grade. Seventh grade, you um, again have a, uh, a nice gain there uh, that uh, brought us closer to the state average. And then in eighth grade, eighth grade you'll see a little bit of a, 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 a backward trend here. And what that is, is those students that are there in an eighth grade, are all really the level one and level two students that are not enrolled in algebra. And so uh, the, the kids that are enrolled in algebra, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, we'll show that on another slide where they are and we're gonna tell you why we've done it that way. So this would be an area of emphasis, but these are the L1s and L2 students that uh, we've gotta look at our curriculums and what we're doing uh, to try to get them to proficiency so that we can push them into algebra. When we look at the, uh, the, the different, uh, the three grade levels here, uh, three through eight, you can see that three through eight, I mean, this is how the state measures it. The state went up 1%, we went up 2%. Three through five, a 1% gain for the state, a 3% gain here for our own school district, and then six through eight, we remain flat, and the state, the state um, went up 1%. When we look here at the algebra and geometry slide, and this is something that I could have easily overlooked, but it's important for us to, for the board to understand that we knew this year that our algebra scores would take a little bit of a dip. We didn't want them to take this big of a dip, but we knew that would happen is because we enrolled, and I want to make sure that you see the number right there. From 17 to 18, we had an additional 570, almost 600 more students enrolled in algebra. And that was done by design. If our students are gonna, algebra is a gateway class for high school and for high school mathematics. And we could keep those children in a liberal arts math class and they'll have a higher grade, but that doesn't help them to be successful in high school. And so you have to balance a, a state measurement system by what's in the best interest of students. And I've always said to everyone, wherever I've been, nobody rises to low expectations. So we've increased the expectations and the rigor for our students by design so that they'll have the opportunity in high school to take accelerated classes and not be behind. It's kind of like uh, students in AP. Some students will take the advanced placement class and they won't, they won't pass the advanced placement test, but they'll get a C um, in that class, which has benefited them more than it would have ever benefit, benefited them, them to not be in the AP class. And the same thing I think holds true here, that we push our students and we push our teachers and train our teachers you know, that you're gonna have an influx of students that are coming in. We can uh, also learning from this to do a better job of improving our um, preparing for the algebra class through the liberal arts class that they would get the year before that. But this is not a bad story. When you get access to these children, 600, almost 600 more kids taking algebra, which will benefit them in high school. Science performance, we have a great story here. In science, you can see a 7% gain in grade three um, compared to a 4% for the state. Grade eight, you'll see a 3% gain compared to 2% for the state and a 3% gain for six through 12, uh, where we outperformed the state in uh, grades six through 12. So uh, kudos to, uh, to the students and how well they did in science and to our, uh, to our staffs for that. And a good story as well in civics and US history, a 2% gain as well as the state. We're at the state average. Uh, we, we matched the state here in civics three through 12. 
and uh, then a little bit behind the state, but uh, in uh, U.S. Uh, history, EOC grades three through five through twelve. But again, the uh, the needle's going in the right direction. So a nice story to tell there. I'm gonna move on now. And is Daryl here? No, he's at the dentist. He's at the dentist. Okay, I hope he's not using no. <laughs> not using no. <laughs> 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 All right. The whole district was displaced, but what, and it, it had an effect on a lot of the departments. But we were going to say that was not going to be an excuse for us not doing services to our schools. But one of the departments that it really had the major effect on would be testing and accountability, and they have done a fantastic job uh, in that area. And I just wanted to point him out. Uh, to talk about it now. These are projections. The last two years, our projections have been right on. And so this is what I'm going to show you now will be worst case scenario. It can't do anything but go better. We've had a 20 point gain in our overall district um, grade points, which will go from 626 to 646. That could go up even higher once we get all the information back from the state. But that'll be the district grade. Uh, we're very confident with that. What I wanted to share with you here is the school grade table, which shows you over the last three years, it shows you the increase in school grades. Um, and you can see that this year we're going to predict uh, nine, nine A's, uh, 14 B's. You have a decline in 14 B's because schools moved up to the A's. You have to see, you can see that we're going to have one D possibly and uh, no F schools, no failing schools for two years in a row. One of the things that's important to look here as well is if we go back and we see the district rank by years, going back to 2004 to now, and see where the district um, uh, performed, this is not in any way any kind of a slam or a slight to um, what's happened in this school district in years past, because that's not the kind of person that I am. But I have heard that people will talk about in the past, our schools, we had more A schools or we had more B schools. That was a different standard. That was an FCAT standard, which, which, which was a much easier standard than the Florida State standards that we have right now. And the FCAT exam itself was an easier exam than what we have now in the assessments. What the Florida State assessments now are really part of the, the National Common Core Movement, although they just changed the name, that's what it was. So that rep represented raising the bar for that. And so you can see that even though that bar has been raised, um, that we've gone up to 32% 30, uh, now. Even though you may not have as many schools that were A and B schools, we're outperforming the state. So it's not really a fair indication when you talk about A schools in the past and, and as compared to the standard now because you're not comparing apples to apples. What you need to be looking at is the state rank and the district points that the state has made. That's comparing apples to apples. And uh, this board has a great story to tell, as does the school district, to be 32nd. And we're anticipating to be, I want to break the teens this year, uh, but we, we can't go back, we can't go and we don't have the capacity to go and uh, pull up and predict every other county. So we'll know in a couple of weeks. But we're hoping to be in the low 20s and to be in the top third, which would be a significant story to tell. Here's our A schools projection, and then I'm showing the, uh, the other schools that we're projecting as well. Uh, to come on, to come on, Manatee Academy, Mosaic, the lower school, Morningside, first year principal will have increased their, uh, uh, Principal Melrose will have increased them from a C to an A and St. Lucie West K-8. We look at our B schools, we can see our projections that are there, Central coming on board, Savannah Ridge, Weatherby, uh, Weatherby's a nice story, White City, um, Principal Mike Hitzman leaving. They are knocking on the A door. They are just a couple of points percentage, and, and if they came back and hit it, we wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but we're doing the, but they've made tremendous growth there at that school, so it was a nice way for Mike uh, to go out on his career. And then you can see our C schools here. Sam Gaines has moved up in St. Lucie Elementary. We got St. Lucie Elementary up there as well. Still uh, work to do in these areas. And what we'll show you in the future when the scores come back, even though a school may not have increased the letter grade, we'll show you the points that the majority of the schools will have increased in points. Many of them knocking or at the cusp of knocking on, a, on a, an increased letter grade. But we'll wait and show that to you as soon as we get the official scores from the state. And then we have to confront the brutal facts as well. And we had a few schools um, that had dropped the letter, a letter grade. Uh, two of the schools that were there, well pretty much three schools, FK Suite, uh, um, our principal retired, and so um, uh, the principal that's there will have you know, a new principal, uh, Flores Elementary, Windmill Point will be under new principals. And then CA Moore, um, when you have smaller numbers of students that are tested, they've had a really good, strong year at the school center, especially dealing with the students. Um, but there's one or two classes that, because they were performed poorly, 
they're right on the cusp of the C and the D. So uh, again, we're doing worst case scenario. Maybe that will change when we hear from the state. You can't do it without good teachers. One of the things that we're very, very proud of is what's happened, and I saw Raphael walk in, is, is really what's happened in the HR department. And you can see right now in June, of right now we're at 106 openings compared to 151 and 179. So if we don't have these teachers and we don't retain these teachers, then um, it has a detrimental effect in our classrooms. This right here also is, I'm gonna segue into the next, into the next. Um, well, I want, I want to talk about ELA. Okay. Going one. If you go back, and this is, this is the thing that I look at the most. I was, I was waiting for you to get done with that area. I didn't want to break you up. I, I didn't have time to talk to you in private about this, but I thought it was interesting. I think, I think we had a lot of growth in between third and fourth grade, and we had a lot of growth in between uh, sixth, fifth, and seventh. And when you look at your ELA, uh, that's not the same chart I'm looking at, growth by uh, grade level, right there. So when you look at your 2017 growth level, and you had your third graders at 49%, and then they go to uh, fifth grade, so they gained a percent, but, the third, but if you look at the state, at the Florida grade level, 58%, that cohort dropped down 2%. So you're gaining on the state at between the levels. And if you look at all across the boards, except for one little area, I think it's between fifth or sixth, mm -hmm. that, that's the only area where we're really lacking. Because right now, if you just look at the difference, you can see us, uh, eighth grade, um, I was looking at 52% from the state, and they went to uh, 58. That, we, we made a tremendous gain there. And you'll see a lot of gains within the certain cohort rather than just comparing them from year to year. But you can see where our students, that slide is going up. And it's just important, just don't, don't, don't get down, but see how, how, how they're going up and up and up. And the state in some areas is going down and we're still going up. So their the grade eight is 55%, 53%, and we went up 2%. So that cohort has almost caught the state average and where they're supposed to be. So uh, no, that's a good point. Um, you can't let folks that uh, want to take a negative slant on things, on the positive events that are happening and what's going on in the school centers, to let negativity overshadow what the positive things are and what our teachers are doing. You know, we'll always defend our teachers and our administrators. And uh, oh, yeah. you have to stay positive. The only place for doubts in the dictionary. You well, yeah, like it's, that, uh, but I heard you talking about third to fourth grade. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. well, wait a minute. They, 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 st they went 49% to 50%. And then the state was at 52% went down. So they are catching up. It's just uh, the third graders that we, we do have to look at the alignment, like you said. But, exactly. but looking at the cohort from shift to shift to shift, from the state to, to, to from fourth grade to fifth grade, those cohorts are catching up and getting learning gains. And, and if I may, with the sure. disruption we had, and we ended the year with over 1,800 registered homeless kids. So. Which means that the real number of homeless kids very likely has doubled that. Mm -hmm. So when you consider the fact those those children are also being successful, even though they may be couch surfing or like the one boy from Port St. Lucie High is living in a tent down by uh, Sam's Club, uh, you know, those type of things, they're still being successful. In some counties that we had the uh, opportunity to interface with last week are not facing the same challenges. And I think sometimes when you have big challenges to face, then you really try to make sure you address them. Well, some counties seem to think they can coast because they don't have those big challenges, and I think that's a detriment to their own students, but that's not my call. But I think when we tell the story of what's going on in this community as a whole and what's happening with our kids on an individual basis, that it, it's something that uh, we should take great pride in. Well, uh, this data just shows in the next couple of years we'll, we'll surpass the state level in a lot of areas. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, you have a state measurement system. That's really not a, it's the system that we have, and we all have to, yeah. you know, we're all held to the same standard. Um, but it doesn't measure the soft stuff, the stuff that happens, the relationship piece, what goes on to the school centers, how that could have been a disaster. Um, those numbers could be, could have, where it happened in other districts, the, district, the states as a whole had a decline, particularly in third grade. That's another point that has to be, has to be brought out. Um, and you don't shy away from that. You look at it and you say, okay, you confront that. It's okay, what can we do to affect that change? That's heavy, heavy lifting. 
That's the greatest challenge that we face in St. Lucie County and in the state of Florida, and probably as a nation as a whole. Uh, because again, the poverty is a, is, a, is, a, is a predictor of this, but it's not a reason why our kids can't achieve at higher levels, of which we've demonstrated that we are moving. And, you, and you'll see gains, and you want to see it moving in the right direction. And you can't let those that would say, well, there's been a, there's been a stumble there. You look at the overall picture, and you talk about the positives of what's going on there. I'm going to move on to my second goal, which was to create the leadership dashboard. This information has been shared with you um, by Dr. Prince, and we're measuring the area of college and career readiness. And so I'm going to do a two for one here because one of my other goals was college and career readiness. Uh, but the, the, the dashboard itself is like a um, it's like a science fiction movie, a monster that keeps growing in a, in a positive sense. I guess a good monster. Um, Could you use a superhero movie yeah, rather than uh, a monster? Okay, a superhero <laughs> movie. Yeah, where we expand. Uh, I'm not into all that, so I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> my heroes are in the room and in the schools. Um, college and career readiness, grades, student safety, attendance, unit assessment, social emotional intervention, and human resources. Human resources, I just showed you a little bit. The slide that's there you won't be able to see um, in detail, but that really talks about our grade distribution, our grades, real-time grades, our demographics, and that, again, that was shared with you. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to refer to the dashboard as well as increase in college and career readiness skills as a two for one uh, using data from the dashboard on this goal. This is something again that this board should be con uh, very, very proud of as is the district. These will be our graduation rate projections. The key words projection won't come out until December or January, but the last two years we have been right on with this. And so you can see Central will maintain an incredible 96%. Westwood High School will gain 3%. Lincoln Park Academy will be at the 100%. Knock it on the door. Uh, Mosaic, uh, performance, look at performance-based diploma from 15 to 44%. Uh, PSL High School, 5% gain. Centennial, a 2% gain. Treasure Coast High School is trying to knock Lincoln Park out as number one there. And when we compare this to the rest of the count of the surrounding counties, our schools will be, you know, will be, this past year, I think three of them were the top three schools. We'll continue to do that. We break it down a little bit more and we get really into the specifics and just look at our comprehensive high schools um, and you'll see our, project, our projection for um, uh, 20, uh, for next year, 96 as we just showed you, 92, LPA at 100. Uh, this is when we, we round up our uh, percentages. You can see that compared, uh, well, the states to be determined. What's interesting about it is our six high schools, and this is a message that has to be shot at, expected to exceed 95%. That's just our regular comprehensive high schools at 95%. And the other schools that count towards the district grade are also in, uh, improving at performance base and the mosaic in particular. I love this picture. Uh, this was, uh, you all know about graduations, another weather event. And uh, Kevin did a nice job. Kevin photobombed that, by the way, but he was deserving <laughs> some. And uh, you can see uh, 3,000 graduates, $34 million in scholarships, 92 uh, future teachers that come back, which makes a difference. And you can see, look at the girl on the right, smiling, and, you know, just so happy. And, uh, you know, a great, great day. And I, and I know that we were able to turn, I've already talked to the principals about this, and some of you were there too. You know, we turned what could have been really a bad moment into a very positive thing. <laughs> and, um, and, and probably going to become the new normal. These are industry certifications, career and readiness, and you can see an increase there at the bottom of almost 300 uh, industry certifications. This is, you know, we want our students either to be prepared for college and or work. So it's not, not, not emphasis placed on one area or placed on another area. I was recently at an uh, EDC thing over on, on Hutchinson Island about a week ago, and there was a panel discussion, and there was a gentleman that goes around um, the different uh, places in the nation and uh, was talking about that guidance counselors, he was saying, and I've heard this before, that guidance counselors are evaluated based upon how many kids they can put in college. And that's not true. That's not true in Florida. That's not true in St. Lucie County. I know it's not true in, in counties that are near us. Um, guidance counselors you know, are, are, are evaluated on the number of kids that are successfully graduating from high school. And as we're preparing those students for college and or the world of work or the military, I'm wearing my red, white, and blue tie today um, for the military. I have a son that's going to past basic training in three weeks. And uh, so we're pumped up about that. Um, got an expert marksman and on grenade throwing and shooting. Just <laughs> I don't know what that means, grenade throwing. Uh, anyway, I digress. College and career readiness as well. You can see. So anyway, college and career readiness, we've done a nice job. On this dashboard, 
And this one here will show math and reading. We're able to start looking at the freshman level and to see who's passed what they need. Again, it's kind of like the Apollo moon mission. We have data to look at and then to adjust what we need to adjust for that individual student. And that's why we were able to do this in such a quick, rapid fashion. A good story to tell there. Um, we, have, we have really partnered, and I'm very proud of the partnerships with the Economic Development Council, with Career Source. Um, we had two counselor bus tours, high school counselors as well as middle school counselors, and they went to some of the manufacturing, because we know that there's a, um, a gap there in manufacturing, and so we have, uh, through, the, through the skills gap analysis that was done through EDC, so uh, some of the suggestions and recommendations, we have jumped on board. So we said take the counselors out to these sites so that they can see firsthand, so that when they are counseling their student uh, that may be going to the world of work, here's an industry, here's something that you, um, you may be interested in. We've had 42 seniors already this year uh, have an interest in some of these um, um, manufacturing businesses in St. Lucie County. That was a big success. We've got the career source and the EDC boot camp that's going on. 15 of our kids are in that. This is a manufacturing apprenticeship through Career Source Florida that was just approved, I think, about a week ago, and those students are involved this summer. The healthcare roundtable, uh, this was held uh, down in, in um, at PSL, and I'm going to, I think there's a video next, so rather than me talk about it, you can hear from the students themselves and the value that this had as we talk about career planning and uh, college and career readiness. It's not there yet, so it'll be on the next one. ABC Medical, I know a couple board members were there as well, where we do internships for uh, the uh, CMAA certifications, and they're trying to fill 230 jobs, and we have 200 students that are certified in this area, and they're already doing internships with those students. We had a great event uh, um, down, uh, down at um, the old bank. But I don't remember what bank it was, right there on Prima Vista. Barnett. Barnett Bank. And, um, you know, great partnerships, and that's a credit really to, uh, to the curriculum department, uh, Dr. Wild. Uh, now it's Alicia Seitz that's in there, and, and, and she hasn't missed a bump. Uh, but, uh, there's been no bump from the transition. This is a video I just wanted to show you when the students were at the healthcare roundtable. A lot of students know what a nurse is and what a doctor is, but they don't know about physician's assistant or a respiratory therapist or a nutrition dietetic specialist. Um, so that's what we're trying to do today is kind of show them that there are lots of different career paths um, and they can go in clinical and administration. I want to be a pediatric oncologist. I want to become a traveling nurse. My end goal uh, in life is to become a CEO or administration of a hospital. Probably an ER physician or an EMT. A pediatric cardiologist. I actually want to be a forensic pathologist assistant. We have 115 students that are here from our school centers uh, and the certified nursing assistant programs. And they come here and they get exposed to the, to the vendors that are here, those that may be looking to hire students. The students take uh, some courses, they learn about soft skills, they learn about what is needed in the job profession, they get information on financial aid. This will really help me because I now that I know that there's job opportunities, I may want to take this field up more seriously because right now I'm just kind of seeing this is a, a field that I want to go into. I think it's so valuable because they're outside of the school, they're actually talking to those in the industry, they get to talk to folks and say, this is the skills we're looking for, this is what you need to have uh, to be successful in this area. It's really eye-opening and we have all these opportunities that's available for us and um, it's really going to prepare us for the future. You learn like how to respect others no matter what ranking you're at, like even if you're a janitor all the way up to you know, being a doctor, you have to have respect. With the financial aid, it shows me that even though maybe like the kids who aren't stable, low income, we can all have a chance to go to college. When you think of college, you think it's like a, a, a very, yeah, very simple, like a I'm um, just sitting in that class and like, it's not as expensive as I thought it was. I thought I'd stay local here because, you know, we save money and then there's so many good opportunities, you know, why not get your education cheaper? And it just gives them a different insight rather than just talking to their teacher who's fantastic or their teachers, you know, they're talking to the outside folks that will be the future employers. So um, I saw that in Hutchinson Island last week too, I wasn't aware of it. And so just to hear from the students and the benefits that they got, and this was a, another, you know, we had Martin County students there as well, um, but it was hosted right here in St. Lucie County and uh, it was an excellent, excellent um, uh, for the students to help them get into, uh, into the medical professions. And you can see you can see the wide variety of, of professions that they're that they're choosing. Uh, this is uh, also in college and career readiness, our Cape Trends, and this is really uh, the number of students that have passed the exams. And there's dollars that are generated from that, so we have a nice story 
uh, to tell they're from all of our high schools that we, we continue to increase that. And then those dollars that are generated go right back, I believe 90% of the money goes right back into the, into the school centers. This is a very, very important slide. Um, that number 83% means that 83% of our high school students are enrolled in Excel. Is, it's not high, is it seniors or high school students? Seniors. 83% of our seniors are enrolled in accelerated classes, uh, which helps them then, whether they're going to college or whether they're going to go into the world of work or into the military, it helps them to be more successful. So when we talk about pushing students in algebra, we talk about pushing students in accelerated classworks, then it pays off for them when they are seniors. And that's a fantastic statistic there. And you can see the AP, IB, the ACE, um, DE, and, uh, and, and CTE. Dual enrollment is what DE stands for. But 83% of our seniors uh, in a, at, uh, accelerated courses. Partnerships that we have, we talk about, and you can see this, but this is with the College Board and SAT. And this is a point I wanted to make as well. We'll, we get free SAT for our juniors, which increases equity and access for students that would never have been able to do that. That's a free value. That's a value of almost $300,000 that we get for free, uh, which, is how, which has a budgetary impact, but more important, has an impact on the students themselves. And when we look at this, this is similar to the algebra. If we look at our district 2016 score of 955, that maintained with uh, an additional um, almost 700 more students taking the test from 16 to 17. These are students that probably wouldn't have taken it in the past. Some of them take it for a concordant score, which helps them meet the, the FSA, but that's almost 700, 690 exactly, students that took it from one year to the young without a dip. Now, we're a little bit behind the state scores, but that's because we give the students that access. And this year, we'll work on more um, SAT preparation courses for the students, but again, that's a great story to tell. That 700 more students have equity and have access to take that exam to help them. Thus, the, the push for acceleration uh, will pay off for these students. It may not necessarily pay off in a score, um, but it pays off for what's most important, and that's the individual student themselves. Naviance, go ahead. Now with 1,600 students, so when we graduate, how many students? Well, there's, um, there's, there's some other ones in there too. There'll be some seniors and juniors. And, well, yeah, yeah. In but that's yeah, still a good number. 3,000. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a real good number. Yep. Seniors aren't capable a lot to take that test. I don't think that's, that most most of them weren't. Well, they usually take it soft. They're so, sophomore and, and junior. This is, this year. Is, this is and the one we'll offered their one. junior year. This We're going to have all the juniors junior. taking this test. So those We're are mostly free. juniors. Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly. 300, So only 700 didn't take it. So that's pretty yeah. good. It's, it's a great story. Um, this is Naviance. This is what we continue to use that aligns the kids to post-secondary goals, whether it is work, whether it is college. And this starts at our uh, middle school grades. I'm going to go to my final goal, decrease the number of out-of-school suspensions. Um, and I want to hit this hard. This is the PBS model schools. And Bill's here, and Bill is, does a fantastic job as his department. We have 22 model schools. That number is going to go up this year. We're going to be talking to our principals because the expectation is within two years, everybody's a PBS model school. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we've seen positive increases in that area. You see an 18, uh, uh, not an increase, but an 18% decrease in bus referrals. We, we pushed this out this year with our bus drivers. They embraced it. We've got a nice story to tell there. More work to do there. But again, uh, working on, um, on positive expectations, champs, and training our teachers in this. So congratulations to Bill and to those schools. And then student safety, this is uh, one of our uh, slides. The 129 means open referrals. At the end of the year, and this is part of the dashboard, that number used to be 1,000 at the end of the year, 1,000 open referrals. Now there's accountability on that. So when, if somebody takes the time to write a referral on a student, it needs to be acted upon. Not to necessarily punish the student, but to find out what the act, what's going on in that student's life. Some, you know, this one that, you know, there is disciplinary action sometimes that has to be done, but you don't want to write a referral and then never act on it. Because then you don't get to interact with that student about what occurred, why did it occur, and what can we do the next time to make sure that this doesn't happen. And so a, a, a nice story there. Our referrals are down 15% over the last three years. That's a, um, another slide that you've seen before from the, uh, from the data dashboard. And then here, out of school re uh, suspensions are reduction. It's important that um, we try to get to the why. This represents, along with third grade reading uh, and, and ELA reading, uh, this represents a big challenge in our school district, uh, not just at the secondary level, but particularly at the elementary level. The kindergartners through the second graders and probably um, we've seen such an uptick in discipline referrals and students that are just so very, very angry uh, when we get them. 
and you know our emphasis next year on mental health and, and, and total child, which we've already had a heavy emphasis on, uh, which will be one of my personal goals. You know, a lot of folks don't know that, and it's not just confined to one demographic area. That is countywide. That is in gated communities as well as in uh, communities that struggle economically. It is countywide, and it's a national issue uh, as well. And then these are our retentions. As we know, a lot of times when students aren't being successful in moving on, that creates other issues. So taking out the third graders right now, um, you can see that we've had a, a, an unbelievable um, decrease in the retaining of students and working on individual plans for those students to be successful. Um, social emotional intervention, this is just another um, slide from the uh, data warehouse that talks about the dis discipline levels, um, how it ties into grades, how it can tie into attendance. I told you that attendance is a major, it was a point of emphasis this year because of the storm and other activities. Um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do in that area. Um, one of the things, and Brian I know is not here, I know he's got representation here, but the Crime Stoppers program with um, students talking in schools, this has been successful. Uh, you've seen some incidents that have been on the news where students told on other students, not necessarily told, but alerted adults that someone was on campus with this or with that, or maybe it was in the community, and we're going to continue to push that. We have these banners everywhere in our school centers. Uh, we had a partnership with PSL Police Department. Uh, 73 truancy, uh, reported truancy, where they've grabbed the students and got the students back in school. Particularly higher at our high schools. Our high school, uh, PSL high school principals are very, very pleased with this program. We've worked very well with that. Um, also in the area of student safety and, 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 and the reduction in, uh, in the, um, in, um, the uh, suspension rate. I don't want to uh, talk, I want to talk to a little bit very briefly about the partnership with the other law enforcement agencies, particularly the Sheriff's Department who stepped up when the parkland occurred and was able to adjust their force to put officers in every one of our schools. Uh, the only department that was able to do that, other departments helped us with visibility within the schools and patrol cars, but they actually put bodies in our school centers. Uh, and then some of them haven't been trained to work with kids, so it was an eye-opening event with them and a very smooth uh, transition and very grateful to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, as well as the other two departments for their increased presence that's out there. Points of pride in wrapping this all up, and, and uh, I think sometimes I hurry through these things because I'm, but I, it's important that we take the time to know what's happening in our district and we tell that story. We do a district climate survey where we hold ourselves accountable and the level of service that we're giving to the schools. When we were displaced from the storms, the first thing I told district staff was there can be no decrease in the level of support. This is about our school centers. And then we're not going to build to have a built-in excuse. It's going to create unique challenges for us, but we're going to rise up and meet that challenge. So here's our top two performers, and it's our school support. That's the executive directors. And what's important about that? That's um, Dan and Latricia and um, um, Lydia. Are two of them here? Okay, they're here. They didn't know I was going to mention them. They're, they they evaluate the principals. They're who works with the principals. This shows that. Um, the principals feel like they're giving them the support that they need, which is the whole key role of them. It's not a, it's not a hammer. It's just what we're trying to do with teachers as well. We're trying to help them be successful. So that's a nice story. And then school security in this day and age, that our, that our principals would feel the confidence that their needs are being met by school security, that they feel like they're safe places. Um, that's a nice story to tell. So those are the top two. But the other ones that are here, and you, can, you can't see them, everyone, almost every department has increased in this and that's what you want to see just like you want to see students increasing through a very challenging year and this next year will be challenging because we are displaced again um, the level of service has increased and we'll continue to do that and to monitor ourselves but almost every department has had a has had an increase there I think three or four of the board members were at this luncheon where we were named one of the uh, best places to work congratulations uh, to Raphael and his department we've got bumper stickers that say that right there and we're putting we put them and put them in all of our vehicles uh, district owned vehicles so folks can see that. I think we're doing the buses too, right? Sir. Okay. Uh, for our school, right there, school bus. Right Go ahead. We, we are the best place to work or we are among the best places to work? The, we are among the best places to work is categorized by the number of employees. Um, so there are several different categories. Okay. So that, that 2017 winners, mm -hmm. we we're, are winners of the highest employee category of the, of the I don't know the, uh, Raphael, I don't know if you know the number. Employees. What's that? Over 1,000. Over 1,000 employees. Okay, we came number one as the best place to work with over 1,000 employees. Okay. 
I need to know that because some people are saying we're among, we're just one of the places of many. So I, we need to know that exactly what did we were number one as far as having over a thousand employees, best place to work in St. Lucie County. Is that correct? Make sure yep. I'm saying it right. And the standards are very okay. high. It's a high standard. We'll get that information for you. I'll so, uh, make sure we can clarify it so that you have exactly what you're saying. We'll get that. I have, I have another question back on sure. the industry okay. certifications. Um, I'd like to know how many industry certifications we currently have, and I also want to get a list of those certifications. Okay. okay. Uh, we have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you do. I want to. You can have that today. Yeah. Not okay. a problem. The, um, this is um, the CASP, uh, the, our, our um, federal assistance, You've, you're aware of this as well, uh, $12.5 million. We got more money than Dade County received for this. I know that there was an open house at CAST the other night. The uh, auditorium was packed. Uh, you know, it was overflowing. Ms. Holly was there, district staff were there, and uh, just what we wanted to see. And uh, Sam Gaines of Emerging Technologies continue to do the enrollment there. And then this year we'll be working, uh, doing the groundwork for Westwood High School. The, um, the data dashboard, we won an award, Districts of Distinction Award, and um, that's my crew. And uh, that was a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a national award, and that's nothing, and there's people calling us all the time. Uh, we could, we got to figure out how we can make money on it. Prince's work, Terrence's is always happening. Yeah, fun. yeah, can you yeah. <laughs> we're, we're talking about that. We're talking about that. We're working at, you know, the other, other companies do something similar, but nobody does it as well as, as we are. Government, so. <laughs> yeah, but the districts of the di distinction, and we won that. We won that award there. The uh, student services. We talked a little bit about this before. Um, during the storm itself, that's when we were getting ready to do the, the school attractor night. So through um, the student uh, assignment office, which you don't hear about very often, that's a tough, tough place. Uh, they set up a north and south satellite location to serve these families, as well as streamline the application process. And they were able to do a homeless identification by 126 percent. So when we talk about our homeless youth through the McKinney Vento, those are the definitions. Um, homeless children and youths are they have a lack of fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. They're from different places. And then you'll see unaccompanied youth. They're not in the custody of their parent or guardian. That's an important story right there. And, that, and, 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 and Mrs. Hensley is actually right. That's a, that's, that's a low number because folks don't want, folk, don't want you to know that. And people lay low uh, regarding this. And what's important to us is that our students are identified so that our teachers are aware of that and our schools are aware of that because you should know the story behind every child that's in your classroom uh, so that you can adjust what you need to adjust in developing those relationships and knowing what's happening there with that. And a lot of folks would be surprised. And this is countywide. I have the numbers per school um, that you will see and it would be higher in our, um, in our, in our high schools. But I have this um, per school uh, broken down uh, by the county as well. In the finance area, um, good story to tell. We've had a CTA uh, settlement prior to the start of year for four consecutive years. David, you're here, right? Are you still here? All right. So we want to keep that going five years in a row, so the pressure's on you. Um, <laughs> 2016, a perfect audit. Because of these audits and because of where we are, we have an investor rating, um, the best possible debt rating, which helps us then when we have to do our, our TANs. That's a borrowing where we have to borrow money at a very, very, very low interest rate. Um, our finance department budget, how this board um, approves the budget and where this money goes. Um, we uh, do a fantastic job with that. There may be some that say, well, no, it's, it's bloated here or there, or it's not cost effective. That's total nonsense. This district um, has been uh, very conservative with the taxpayers' dollars and have put this money into the schools. In fact, when the extra dollars come in from the state, of which there's none this year except 47 cents per student, but in the last couple of years, if it was 2% or 2.1%, those dollars went directly back into employee salaries first before they went anywhere else. And we'll con continue that, even though there's um, not a good story to tell this year from the state. Um, risk management, a big deal too. This has an economic impact. We had a 70% reduction in lost time uh, compared to the same six month period last year and almost 100% of uh, 2018 benefits, there's full enrollment. So Susan Carver and, and her staff over there have done a nice job with that. And that is a way of, uh, of uh, a cost savings. Legal services, they were in the top five of the uh, 
What we don't understand is a lot of times they get inundated with calls from, from schools all the time regarding different legal issues that are going on in the school center between parents, um, mostly between parents. And um, they're in the top five working with that and they've kept their exp expenses very low. This year, child nutrition, you can see the perfect audit. This is important that our children are fed if they're going to learn and they've done a nice job with that with our free lunches and our, our uh, smarter lunch rooms. Go, go out and check out Westwood and uh, PSL in August and see what's going on there. Technology, Terrence does a fantastic job. You can see that uh, the, the, the information that's there. Two, two, 2,000 new laptops through the WAVE process, the grant that they've received. Uh, you know, an area that just changes every day. Um, they're the only group that's still in the old building. And uh, so if anybody had anything to complain about, it would be them. And yet, Terrence's uh, role has increased, um, and he's met that on head on, uh, doing a nice job with that. But his IT staff is, uh, is doing very, very well. We haven't hit everybody. Partnerships, advisory boards, work experience, we've talked a little bit about that. And uh, this is kind of the logos of some of the, this doesn't represent everybody. But these are some of the uh, major uh, um, partnerships that we have with, uh, with uh, our different government agencies and our different groups that are out there. And a lot of that's done by district office, a lot of that's done in the schools. If we had school partnerships, that they have partnerships with different businesses that are lo 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 uh, located close to them, uh, you'll, you would see even a, a larger number there. Our communications area uh, of expanding that as well, of trying to get the word out, the good news that's out is right there. Um, I'll close this and I'll talk about, my, uh, I'm just about done. Just want to see if there were any other questions on this part of it before I close out with next year. Everybody good? All right. Um, what I want to do is, uh, that's little, uh, that's little Aubrey right there, Aubrey Dolan. Aubrey Dolan, I don't know if you remember, but when Parkway came and sang, she's the young girl that sang the national anthem, and just a little sweetie, and uh, so I went over to the school and gave her the plaque. Didn't know it, her mother works at the school as well. Uh, and uh, she's one of our special needs students, and when she went into the classroom, all the kids were coming over there and high-fiving her, and she started to sing some more songs. You know, it's just certain, mem certain moments stand out to you during the course of the year. Um, and so that's Aubrey, and that, uh, that, uh, that's, she represents all of the boys and girls that we have right here. And I'm gonna go back and see her again uh, and see how she's doing. And I'm not sure if they're gonna come back, but you never forget when she sang that national anthem, that was a very, very touching moment. None of us can do that except Kevin. Um, and, uh, but uh, the little girl did that. And so goals for next year, continue to work on the ELA proficiencies, even though we've seen gains there, that's still gonna be a major point of emphasis. Uh, safe and secure campuses. We will be sharing with you at our workshop in, in July what we're doing differently for next year. Uh, single points of entry, uh, the work that's been done by Brian's department and local law enforcement on going out and doing assessments on our campuses, high priority. And then thirdly, really, uh, we've done a nice job with the delivery of service, the, the total child, but uh, with the new state legislation that's coming down to make sure that um, we have a heavy emphasis on that and that we're working on those mental health needs of, of our students and working with our teachers on how to identify that and in the most, the easiest way possible uh, to do that. When I close out, this was the picture and I know that uh, I think Troy uh, was there and, and, and Mrs. Hinsley were there. This is a picture of our principals and this is some of our district staff. Some folks are missing because we couldn't grab everybody at one of our meetings here. But all the successes that I've talked about um, today are a tribute to the folks that are in this room, including this board, as well as the folks that are on the front line. Those principals that are out there, the administrators, our teachers, our support staff, from bus drivers to custodians, to, to the facilities, to the maintenance gentlemen, to, to everyone, that's all a contribute to them. Um, we get attacked in public education. You get candidates that are running for local school board offices, you got candidates that are running for uh, state seats, you've got candidates for national seats that will attack public education. Public education, and I have it right here, my Statue of Liberty that we have in every school. We're the only vehicle for students that if they come to this, they come here, we're going to enroll them and we're going to give them a quality education. And it's not easy, but it's really what separates this country from other countries. And we were, we've been doing this for, for, uh, for, for a lot, you guys were doing this before I came with that philosophy, that we meet every child's needs. But it can't happen without the staff that's out there. And so we've always, instead of beating them up, and instead of folks being critical of them, they need to support them. Uh, the, the culture and the assumption of, of laying blame is something that's, um, there's no place for it. And we have our challenges and we also have our success stories. 
And so I left the principals with this final quote, I hope it pops up here in our little thing. Um, and this is really for district staff, for teachers, for everyone that works for us, step into my shoes, walk in the life I'm living. If you get as far as I am, maybe you'll see how strong I really am. So I want to close just with congratulating all of our school centers, congratulating this board, congratulating the team in here for what I consider to be an outstanding year in spite of some major, major challenges. I still always say our best days are still ahead of us, but we've got uh, Mark Twain. If you're on the right track, you get run over, you don't keep moving, and we're going to continue to keep moving in that positive way. In two weeks, you'll vote on my um, evaluation. Between that and now, if anybody wants to meet one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I'm happy to do that to talk about any issues, concerns anybody would have, and then that'll come forward as well as the goals for next year. I know that was a little long but I felt like it was important that uh, you got a little more detail on what the positive things that are going in the school so we can spread that. It was very thorough. I'll thank you. We appreciate that, that presentation and this work session. Board members, do we have any questions, anything, any thoughts on our mind that we want to cover? Just, we didn't talk about the VPK scores, but private providers, the VPK scores are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And if you remember Office of Early Learning, we didn't do testing for two years, or we did testing and we didn't use the scores. It is a nightmare right now, and I guess we have, have challenged Office of Early Learning and Department of Education because the scores, there's no authenticity in the scores. And when we talk about early intervention, um, you know, I think about that, and I think about the phonemic awareness and all the expectations, children coming into us, not only do the children speak English, the parents don't speak English. And we deal with that every day. And this is why VPK is so important for that first introduction into the school system. But the other piece of that, that I feel when we look at safety and security, and we have children at a very early age that are coming to us, um, not only um, with special need, autism, um, sensory disorder, I mean, just a multitude of problems, we're in a state that really does not give us much help, and they continue to cut Medicaid. My issue has been if I have families that don't have Medicaid, trying to find psychological services for these families is extremely difficult. Um, fortunately, the, the Early Learning Coalition has tried to step up, but if we're not fixing problems with three, four, five, six-year-olds, or well, three, four, five, and then they come into our school system, and if it not had some type of psychological intervention, it's a perfect recipe. And these children we know grow up to be children that are committing violent crimes in our schools. So as we step back and, and look at security and deputies in the schools, we need to come back and look at early intervention. Many of these children have been sexually, physically abused and, and that type of thing. So I'm hoping possibly with the new governor, with people that really take mental health seriously because they talk the talk but they don't walk the, the walk, um, that we'll look at intervention very early. Our foster care children, uh, we see more and more grandparents raising children. That has become the norm um, because both parents are unavailable. And so that's, that's something that I didn't see 10 years ago and now the uptick. And you add poverty to that or a disability to that and it's a recipe for some violent behavior. So I, mean, I would just put that out there that we do look at the VPK and that we do um, look at the mental health piece because that's great. The state says we're going to do it in the school system, but they're really not doing it before kids come to us. No, it, it's, a, it's a great point. It's um, one area that the board's to be commended in is your advocacy. Your advocacy at the local level um, because of your jobs, but also the advocacy at the state level. Uh, Mrs. Holly is now the consortium president. The consortium <laughs> president. Um, so it, it's something that we just don't talk about here locally, but that you guys are active in the, and, and board members do go up to Tallahassee and we talk to our local folks. But common sense, and it's just common sense that if you hit the children early, we won't have the issues at the other end. But that's going to take an immigration type movement on the behalf of citizens to say enough is enough because they think it's only isolated to certain areas. And the mental health and the ACE, the adverse childhood experiences, and how that relates to academic performance, how that relates to social performance, how that has an impact on your, your, your life and the years, of how long you will live based upon um, medical conditions. We, you know, we, we've really been uh, getting into that heavily, but different folks need to see that at a different level. We are so resilient. 
particularly in St. Lucie County, with less and less and less, continuing to do more and more and more, which is really a tribute to the board itself and to the employees that we have here. So we don't really make, you know, we don't make excuses about it. We can fund it and we say, okay, here's the best, the best avenue. But you're exactly right. If we don't start at that age, and then we see that in, in scores, and we see that in discipline, and we see those, those things, and on an epidemic proportion, you see it. Everybody in here works with kids in different organizations. So we see it probably better than, than anyone, again, which is a credit to the board and your advocacy and, and your being involved in, in the communities. So it's forefront, and we get some of that. Yeah, it's, um, there's a political reason why that was done, and like you say, maybe it takes a change before we can uh, get to where we need to get. Yeah. So we'll wait, if what I may, Madam Chair, uh, we did make a bus with Office of Early Learning. Yeah, that's um, um, <clears throat> there is ongoing conversation with Rodney McKinnon, who's the head of OEL, uh, to use those scores that came out as just a baseline, because there's nothing to compare them to, and don't be great anything, don't be doing anything with them. This is kind of a baseline. Also, the discussion about the earliest intervention for families in crisis. As you know, we're 50th in the country now, I believe, on funding for children in crisis. So um, there, those conversations are ongoing. Where they end up is going to probably depend significantly on what happens in the, the near future. And, and one of the areas that I have seen personally is that, um, and that I was at one time told my preschool was not, not age appropriate. But what we did was we started phonics on the preschool level. And I heard you mention, uh, Mr. Jen, about looking into really working in the phonic area, uh, the, the, the rules of phonics, the law of phonics, the blending, that type of thing. And it helped increase our children's reading skills. And we know that age appropriate, we want the children to enjoy what they're going through, but we do need to look at that as a community, you know, with our agencies that do the funding and, and to the different child care centers and put things in place that though we can start earlier in the area of reading before they get to us in the community as well as in the school. My, 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 my thought is um, as far as a school, how many BPK students do we have? Do we, we still have our... We have 17 units. Okay, and that's, that's the same thing with us as a school district. We need to look at starting even before the K with the, with the phonics. We need to start earlier and teach our children the basic rules of phonics. And they can learn it because we have dealt with inner city children since well, over 30 years and have taught them through our preschool to read. So they can learn it at that age. Yes, we do need the parental part. We do need uh, our schools. We do need our community. We need all of it together. But we can do a whole lot at an early age in the area of reading, even before they get to the, to the kindergarten level. And I think we should look at that in our own. We'll be business. sharing with you in, in um, July our specific steps of what we're doing different for next year uh, in, in, the, in the area of um, particularly in third grade, but in other areas as well, yeah. um, kindergarten yeah. through second grade. Uh, there'll be a heavy, heavy emphasis on, on staff development well, what I'm and saying different right programs. Now, I'd like it to be a heavy emphasis even on the VPK. Well, with VPK, that goes to say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All, of, all of that. Actually, it needs to be on the readiness program. Yeah, the school readiness, yeah. yeah. So, and we work, so. we, you know, we have good partnerships with, um, with Tony and, 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 and Early Learning Coalition. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we can do that. Um, but we could be much more effective if we had the political support from Tallahassee to yeah, give us dollars sure. there to make it happen. But at the same time, like you've said over yeah. and over, we make no excuse. Exactly. We right. do what we have to do. Well, and you should know that after eight years of pushing the state, we actually have the ability to do quality matrix now for child care centers. And so that's, a, that's something new because we were uh, not allowed to do that in the past. And after so many years of putting state money and federal money into a program called Ellis, which they never got <laughs> off the ground. Oh, I remember that said, one. Um, that they actually do now have a new program so they can share best practices and keep track of that. So that's going to hopefully spur. We had anticipated that putting Office of Early Learning under the Department of Education would help a better uh, walk across, basically, so there'd be a continuum. That, however, has not really happened yet. There are two very isolated insti in, uh, institutions that don't seem to have the ability or the willingness to talk to the other. So we're working on that. Well, 
was the Department of Education now going to come under the Department of Labor? Yes. Very That's federal. Confusing. Very confusing. That's federal. <laughs> I know. But. So, Ms. Harley, uh, this thing is all. Do you have any last comments before we close out our session? No. No. I, I have one other thing to say. We are going to have a generation of kids with post-traumatic stress from these children that are housed with the immigration situation. And that is real post-traumatic stress. And it, I cannot even watch it on TV. It is so painful to me personally. And I hope everybody will search their heart and mind um, at the situation because we are affected. We do have children in the state of Florida that are now being housed. And I know Senator Nelson was on TV trying to gain access to check and he was refused and given a stack of paperwork and told to fill it out before they would let him in to see the facility and see the condition of the children and they told him to come back in two weeks. And this is an elected person in the state of Florida which is frightening to me that they're, you know, we need to be aware. Who's gonna deal with the kids with the post-traumatic stress when they do come out? It's gonna fall on the school system. So it's gonna fall on all of us. And that's where we all need to come out and be a voice. We all need to be praying. That's what we need to be advocacy. doing because these are tough times. Be a right voice, be an advocate. Yeah. So if we can end on a positive note, I will tell you that years ago when we did expulsion hearings, we expelled, uh, we would have four to six or seven expulsion mm -hmm. hearings in an evening. We would have them twice a month. We expelled, my first year, we expelled 168 kids to the street. We have not had an expulsion hearing at all this past year. And the year before, what did we have? Four? Yeah, yeah. Go team. Well, and it also uh, attributes to not only that, it means kids are staying in school and, and you know, our uh, alternative schools are working and putting them back into the school system and they're graduating on time. That's right. So, I mean, uh, Bill Tomlinson and uh, everybody Every department. Every single department has worked overtime to make this happen, and we are so appreciative. We want yep. you, to, we want you to know that um, we know that it has taken extremely hard work, and and I know that our kids are very grateful. Uh, Mr. Gent, you mentioned about uh, with the homeless kids, and 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 those kids that are living alone, right. and there are quite a few of them yeah. that are attending our schools that have their own place and are living by themselves and they need someone to focus on them. To see. And that's what we've done. We've gone out and have gotten them in and gotten them back in, and so we do appreciate all of your work, and we do have a lot of good reporting that um, we will not be intimidated by others that want to tear down our district and, and not look at all of the achievement that we've had. And so we are definitely spreading that good news, and we thank you for this very in-depth um, oversight of what has happened through the school year and for your labor as well. Thank you. Staff, we'll keep you for another year. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Just one? <laughs> Just one? <laughs> I want to hear one. No matter what they say. That's right. Okay. Not all mine's clear. <laughs> Staff, okay. you can take Friday off. <laughs> <laughs> so we will officially adjourn our meeting.